It's good to have you with us this morning on this rather cool start to the day, but uh, apparently it's going to turn out uh, just as nice as yesterday did, so uh, we're in for a good afternoon. Uh, we, uh, uh, we know, don't we, that uh, as we're inhabitants of a fallen world. Um, actually, I think that's just slightly, slightly loud. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah. Uh, we, we're inhabitants of a fallen world, and uh, through life, uh, we often uh, face heartache. Uh, we face intimidation. There are giant obstacles that uh, kind of rear their head at times. And for some of us, uh, life hasn't gone the way that we wanted it to. Life can be difficult, challenging. There are struggles that uh, we face. They arise unexpectedly. And as followers of Jesus, we're not immune from these kinds of experiences. But it's often during these times that we learn to trust God's faithfulness and God's goodness. When we're emotionally distraught or, or struggling uh, and our world is caving in, it's good to be able to place our trust in God's promises toward us. And the proof of God's faithfulness comes in different ways, doesn't it? With friends, the testimony of God's goodness and music in song, um, reminding ourselves that as God has been with us in the past, we can hold on to his scripture promises for the future. Later on this morning, we're going to continue our studies in Jeremiah, and this is Jeremiah's experience. It's not always physical suffering. It can be mental anguish, questioning where God is in both Jeremiah's and our experience. So as we begin, can I read to you some scriptures from Psalm 104? And this is the, the uh, psalmist, David, uh, just writing of his experience and his observation around when he's going through difficult times. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they're terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. And may my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. So, brothers and sisters, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a, 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 a great song that uh, we know well, um, and in times of difficulty, the, these words are the promise of God to us. Great is your faithfulness. So, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we recall your steadfast faith and the hope that you have given to us. We thank you for faith that we have learned through experiences that have come our way, and we pray that we might follow the example of, of men and women who have gone before us and place our faith in you and your word. Father, we pray that you would help our faith to grow, that it might develop an ever-deepening trust in you, that we might know and have that full assurance that you are both faithful and true. And help us as we experience and place our trust in you, that we might learn to delight in your presence, that we might be nourished by your word day by day.
We thank you for your faithfulness season after season, year after year. Some of us have been on the journey for many years and we have proven your goodness and your companionship along the way. This has caused us to grow in our faith and our trust in you. Others of us have only recently stepped out on the journey. And sometimes we wonder whether we will finish the course. Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us courage, that you would help us to endure and run the course that you have set before us. So this morning we come to think afresh about your faithfulness, and your goodness toward us. Father, lift our hearts, lift our eyes, that we might see afresh all the blessings that we have received in Jesus. Help us to imitate his life in us. And we pray this in the very wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, Jeremiah 20 uh, and uh, Brian is going to bring it to us.
Thanks, Brian. Uh, when you read Jeremiah, often the words are pretty depressing. And uh, that's kind of uh, the start of his depression setting in, and we'll look at some of the truths that we can learn from that shortly. Before we open God's Word, we're going to stand and we're going to sing uh, another song. Uh, we'll just sing it through twice. We know it well, but again, it picks up the theme of God's faithfulness towards us, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We'll sing it through twice. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning New every morning, great is your faithfulness, O Lord, great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They are new. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence this morning to hear your word to us. Your word is perfect. Your word comes and brings renewal and refreshment to our lives. And so we pray that as we look at these words that Jeremiah spoke long ago, that we might be encouraged that your Holy Spirit would come and do his work in our hearts and lives. Father, we live in difficult days, but you are the one in whom we place our trust. Father, forgive your servant, for his sins are many, and we have come this morning to see Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. When I was uh, growing up, uh, my dad was, uh, he was a Baptist pastor, and I had the privilege, along with my brothers and sisters, to uh, be brought up in the largest Baptist church in New Zealand at that time. Uh, the attendances regularly, most Sundays, were anywhere between five and six hundred. Uh, my youth group was almost a church on its own. We would regularly have uh, had a youth group of 120. Uh, and, and it was just a great time to be alive. And uh, just in the church itself, uh, there was a sense of expectancy. There were conversions, there were baptisms. Uh, everything was going really well. And then in 1970, I was... Uh, I had just turned 16, and very suddenly, uh, quite out of the blue, my mum had a nervous and physical breakdown. She suffered from very severe depression. Uh, at 16, you don't understand uh, everything that's going on, and uh, she would spend days just lying in, br in bed, uh, there was a, she talks about a, just a blackness uh, and uh, this was kind of turned our world upside down a little. My sister was 14, my younger sister was 14. Uh, she took on all the responsibilities of uh, meals and things for us as a family. 
Uh, Dad was still busy, uh, as you can imagine, running a church of that size, and I can remember very vividly at times, didn't matter whether it was early in the morning or sometimes 10 o'clock at night, there were occasions when he would come running into my uh, room or, or to me and say, Mum's just grabbed the keys to the car, we don't know what she's going to do. Uh, she had suicidal thoughts. Uh, Dad's fear was she would drive the car off a cliff or something or other. And so I had the job of hopping on my bike, uh, motorbike and uh, sort of trailing her to make sure that she didn't do anything uh, untoward. Uh, if she did, I'm not sure what I would have done anyway on a motorbike with her uh, kind of in the car. They were really difficult days for us as a family. And thankfully today, she's a lot better. She's 91, uh, and, uh, over, but it's taken a long time. It's been a long process for healing to come to her. Now, as, as I was reflecting on Jeremiah 20, I guess my thoughts went back to experiences, and, and this was a major one for me and also in our family. It reminded me that Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are not immune from difficulty. Christians are struck down with illness, with depression, with breakdowns. Pressure comes in different ways to us. And Jeremiah 20, in that passage that uh, Brian read to us, Jeremiah has plenty of reasons to dive back under his bed covers, to give up, because it's a really low point in Jeremiah's ministry. The blame for Jeremiah's despair is a priest by the name of Pasha. He is the chief of uh, security around the temple area there in Jerusalem. He's in charge of the prophecy police. And he'd heard Jeremiah, he'd heard that Jeremiah had taken a very valuable uh, clay pot and he'd smashed it to the ground just in the valley outside of the temple of Jerusalem. And he'd also been a listener. And there had been several occasions where he had heard uh, Jeremiah utter his prophecy about how Jerusalem was going to be taken and smashed to smithereens. Well, Pasha believed that Jeremiah was a man full of treason. And so Pasha had God's uh, prophet arrested and tortured. It's a bit like a lot of post-Christian regimes that we're facing today. People are not always sympathetic to God's disciples. Now, Jeremiah's been threatened before, but this time we're told the authorities take action. So they arrest him, they flog him, they torture him. We're told that Jeremiah is placed in stocks, which actually is more than just locking him up. The Hebrew word for stocks actually means to be twisted. So in other words, Jeremiah is placed on a rack. He's clamped by his wrists and his body is twisted into very painful contortions. Well, what Pasha did was, was wicked. And apparently, according to these early verses in chapter 20, he feels some remorse. So the next morning, he goes down to the jail and he frees Jeremiah. But the damage has already been done. Pasha has beaten the Lord's anointed. He has opposed God's faithful minister. And that always brings God's curse. So Jeremiah is released, but he's not finished. He gains a little bit more courage and he, he is brought into the presence of Pasha and Jeremiah greets him with a message of judgment. And we read those uh, from um, verses 3 through to 6. The message is not Jeremiah's, 
It's a message that is brought to Pasha from the Lord. And this prophecy is very significant for what it says about God's people, namely the nation of Judah. Jeremiah has often warned God's people that judgment is going to come from the north and until this point, right through all of Jeremiah, the oppressor has not been named. But we learn in the reading this morning that it will be the nation of Babylon that will come down, will invade and be the instrument of divine judgment on God's people. And from this time in the book to the end of the book, the name Babylon is mentioned uh, more than 200 times. This prophecy has significance for Pasha. You can imagine Jeremiah standing in his presence, his wrists are still throbbing, his back is uh, kind of an open wound, uh, he's still chafing from the imprisonment that he's been in. But Pasha's, uh, Pasha's punishment is going to be even more severe than what Jeremiah experienced. And Jeremiah delivers God's word and says, the day is coming, Pasha, when your friends will fall by the sword. You are going to be taken as a captive and you will be put to death. All your lies will be exposed. All the crimes you've committed will be repaid with death. And Jeremiah even has the satisfaction of giving Pasha a nickname. It's one that's probably bound to stick. It's not one that we hear in our day, but uh, in the scriptures he is going to be called Magor Misabib. Magor Misabib. It means, uh, it means uh, terror on every side. There's nowhere that Pasha is going to go that he's not going to experience trouble. Which is actually the exact opposite of what his name means. Pasha, fruitful on every vine. No longer. Well, this is the story that introduces chapter 20 to us. But it's not the whole story. It doesn't tell us what Jeremiah was thinking while he was sitting there incarcerated in this prison. But it's a reminder to us, brothers and sisters, isn't it, that life is for us is often hard and difficult. To be honest, for most of us, life can often be very unfair. If we have the privilege of living long enough, we experience unfairness. We experience injustice. There is ridicule. There is discrimination. And there are occasions where even unexpected tragedy enters our lives. And for many people, these experiences can throw them. On the whole, we don't expect to suffer. On the whole, we believe that life should treat us well. But the reality is, that's not true. And in Jeremiah 20, we find four very valuable lessons about what it is to live in this world and what it is to suffer. They're relevant for all of us. They're relevant for all times. Because the Bible doesn't kind of, uh, it's not all candy floss. The Bible reminds us again and again that God's people always suffer. And I think this section is particularly relevant for us as we're entering and living in post-Christian times. So the first lesson, and maybe the most important that we find in this chapter, is very simple, but also profound. 
that our suffering may be taken to the Lord in prayer. Jeremiah has every reason to be discouraged. He's in danger. Look at verse 10. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived, and then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. So here's Jeremiah standing in the precincts of the temple. And out of the corner of his eye, he can see the priests standing around <coughs> in the different corners, maybe gathered in little groups, and he hears these nasty whispers. And he looks up and he sees his bony fingers pointed in his direction. Even his friends wait for him to take a false step and they're ready to pounce upon him. Well, he's already been beaten. He's already been locked up. And Jeremiah is wondering, well, what on earth are they going to do to me now? What's coming next? Maybe this persecution I've just endured is only the beginning. So the prophet is, in, is discouraged. He's kind of become a bit of a laughing stock around the temple. Look at verse 7b. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everybody mocks me. You can imagine maybe the comedians in Jerusalem getting their funniest material at Jeremiah's expense. There goes crazy old Jeremiah. Did you hear what he did yesterday? He, he, he went out and he took a brand new pot and he smashed it outside the city walls. He's doing strange things. He needs to be put in a straitjacket. He keeps babbling on about enemies who are going to come and destroy the city. And, and, and you'll note that there's one insult that is especially vicious. Note in verse 10, they call Jeremiah Magor Misabib. Terror on every side. That's the nickname God gave through Jeremiah to Pasha, his enemy. Now they're turning it around against God's prophet. Verbal abuse. It may not seem very serious compared to a good old beating, but maybe some of you know that eventually ridicule starts to take its toll. And Jeremiah now is feeling very despised, very discouraged, rejected. Jeremiah's friends have betrayed him, even though he thought that they were the closest of friends of all. But more than that, Jeremiah begins to vent his feelings towards God. Verse 7, verse 8. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. In other words, Jeremiah is now starting to doubt whether God's word is really true after all. God, is for, God remember, called Jeremiah God called him to be a prophet to his people. And he prophesied. And he prophesied judgment was coming. But where's, where, where is the judgment? How is God dealing with his people? Has Jeremiah become a false prophet? Am I really speaking the words that God wants me to? Maybe I've been fooled. Maybe I've been deceived. Maybe God's deceived me. But here's the truth. <clears throat> that the only thing that Jeremiah can do with his doubts and sufferings is take them to God in prayer. And so he offers up these prayer, the prayer of a suffering believer. 
And we can imagine him there all alone. And he's overcome. He's just plain exhausted by physical and emotional pain. The first thing he does is he cries out to God. And brothers and sisters, I, I, I think in the context of this, I, I want to re- say to you this morning that God gives us permission to take our sufferings directly to him. This is what godly people have done through history. Remember Job in the Old Testament. All the destruction that came upon his business life, upon his family directly. He's on the ash heap of life. And in Job chapter 3, he brings his suffering, his lament to God. What about Elijah the prophet? (coughs) Just being called to stand up against the false gods of Baal. He's destroyed uh, the prophets. Now where do we find him in 1 Kings 19? He's sitting under a broom tree and he wants God to take his life. What have you done to me, God? How how am I going to keep on living? The king and and his army are are against me. They're, They're searching for me. God, just take me out of the situation. What about David? Psalm 57. There he is hiding in a cave, fleeing from Saul and all his army. And Jonah. Jonah too, anointed and appointed by God to go and be a messenger to the city of Nineveh. Take my message to them, Jonah. He's scared, he flees. Now he wails to God because he's found in the belly of a great fish. And brothers and sisters, isn't this even what Jesus did when he was on the cross? Here he is, called to take away the sins of the world. Here he is, crucified to atone for people's sins. And what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Brothers and sisters, I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what pressures of life may be pushing in and pressing in upon you. But I can say that God's word reminds us that when those pressures come upon us, we can take how we feel, we can take those experiences uh, experiences of suffering to that secret place where we meet God in prayer. And as believers, that's the place where we must take them. Where else can we unburden our hearts so freely? Who else will come and in the midst of our grief and our sorrow and our suffering, that pressure, who else will come and comfort us so tenderly? So we have no need to hide our troubles. We can take them to God in prayer the way that Jeremiah did long ago. And then the second truth that we learn from Jeremiah here is that Sometimes that suffering we experience comes and we suffer for God's sake. See, Jeremiah knew why the people hated him. They were getting tired of hearing him preach judgment all the time. Verse 8, Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. In other words, God is to blame for the predicament that Jeremiah finds himself in. But it's not the prophet's fault. He's been insulted day in, day out, 
He just said what God had told him to say. But there were people around like Pasha who blamed the messenger. Their real problem was with the message. And Jeremiah suffers because he's being obedient to God in the message that he is proclaiming. And so as Jeremiah reflects on his problem, he comes up with a possible solution. It's there in verse 9. I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. Well, that sounds pretty good. That's it. I'm through with all this. I'm going to hang up my sandals. I'm not going to wander around Jerusalem anymore. I'm going to go out and get a real job. I'm not going to speak the word of God anymore. But there's a problem, you see. And the problem is that when you try to keep God's word bottled up inside, you can't. Vance Habner uh, was a, a, a wonderful uh, expositor of God's word in um, the US. He, he died only a few years ago. A and I think this is a great quote. Jeremiah announces the impossible. He resigns and then declares immediately he cannot resign. He quits, but he cannot quit. So in verse 9, if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it, and, uh, uh, holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. The burden of speaking God's word overcomes them. It's just so powerful. And any faithful proclaimer of God's word knows this experience. Jeremiah is speaking about fire in his bones. He's not saying that ministry is always pleasurable. He's not saying that he gets his strokes every day from the privilege of being able to speak God's word. No, he's saying that when God's word grabs your heart, what else can you do but proclaim it? Your heart is aflame with the gospel. Your heart is aflame with the good news of Jesus. You have to share it. You have to declare it. The trouble with Jeremiah was that the message he'd been given was one of judgment. And he wasn't eager to preach that. He was a reluctant preacher in that sense at this time. He knew that judgment and scorn would come his way once he opened his mouth. And Jeremiah would have given anything to be able to be, have a silent ministry. But he says here, the word of God won't allow that to happen. I can't help myself. The fire in the bones for the gospel of Jesus, for the word of God has got to blaze forth from my lips. It reminds us, for those of us who have the privilege of teaching God's word, that we are called to simply say what God says. And this is one of the great lessons of Jeremiah's ministry. He's surrounded everywhere by false prophets. They are going around saying everything that the people want them to hear. So in, verse, uh, uh, in chapter 6 and 8, you, you hear them say, peace, peace when there is no peace. But Jeremiah is a true prophet. And this is the distinguishing mark of true prophets. They preach nothing except the message and the word that God gives them. Faithful ministers will always preach law and grace. They will preach justice as well as mercy. They will speak judgment as well as salvation. But authentic, authentic preaching always disturbs as well as, confront, uh, as well as comforts. And sometimes in life, preaching leads to suffering. Proclaiming the true word of God, the message of God, 
lead, may lead to opposition. Sometimes hostility. Sometimes, in other places, persecution. Sometimes believers suffer for the sake of the Word of God, especially if we live in a culture that has turned its back upon God. So Jeremiah needs to take courage from the promises that God has made, that God made when he first commissioned him to be a prophet. Remember back in Jeremiah 1? I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, even against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you. This commission, right at the start of Jeremiah's ministry, makes it very clear that Jeremiah will suffer for God's sake. But the Lord promised more than suffering. He promised that his prophet would be saved. And doesn't Jesus make that same promise to us? Remember how Jesus explained to his disciples, and we read it in the Gospels, you will suffer for my sake. You will be mistreated. You will be hated by the world. Some of you, even for my sake, will be put to death. But then Jesus ends with this promise in John 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. It's a wonderful verse to commit to memory. It's a wonderful verse to apply to our daily life. Christians often have many troubles in this world. We get depressed. We get disheartened. We get discouraged. And often we can sit back and we think, why is this happening to me? Well, Jesus says it. Suffering for God's sake should not be a surprise. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Christ has overcome the world. Very quickly, the third lesson, God is always to be praised even in the midst of suffering. There's a little worship service here in the midst of uh, the passage Brian read. It's very short. Uh, his, his words here uh, contain three elements. Jeremiah gives a confession of faith. He gives a prayer for us, uh, prays a prayer for deliverance and he offers a hymn of praise. Verse 11 is his confession of faith. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Jeremiah didn't understand what was happening to him. Even God seems to be against them. But he continues to testify what he knows to be true about God's character. And Jeremiah knew that in the midst of his experience, God was with him. Even though it felt, and he felt, that God was far away, the prophet knew that God is strong, even though he felt powerless. He knew that the wicked would be destroyed, they'd be defeated. And so the prophet boldly confesses, Lord, you're the one who can save me. That's his confession of faith. But in verse 12, he also prays for help. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I've committed my cause. Jeremiah doesn't take matters into his own hands. He simply commits his cause to God. 
He certainly prays that he'll be vindicated. He prays that his enemies will be punished. And then he closes with a song of praise in verse 13. It's as if his heart bursts into song. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Can you imagine Jeremiah there bent over in the stocks, manacled to this rack or whatever? He may not have had the breath to sing along him, but he could manage a short song of praise, just like Paul and Silas in Acts 16, where they're sitting in a Roman prison. They praise God from the prison. So Jeremiah comes through his doubts, to, from this place of strong confidence in God. And Jeremiah shows us how to praise God during the dark nights of the soul. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian. He was imprisoned for preaching God's word. Bonhoeffer endured the dark night of the soul in a Nazi concentration camp. Yet if you read his letters and his writings, he didn't stop praising God. I'm lonely, but you do not leave me. I am restless, but with you there is peace. Brothers and sisters, it's always good to praise God. The best thing to do when we're discouraged is to worship to keep confessing God's name, to keep praying, to keep singing. It's good to confess our faith in Him. The trouble is, and here we're going to close, The trouble is that this is not how the prophet's cry to God ended. And at this point, Jeremiah finishes on a downer. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news who made him very glad, saying, A child's born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon, for he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave, her womb enlarged forever. Shocking word. Instead of celebrating his birthday, Jeremiah curses it. He wants to reach back into history, back into time, and curse everything and everyone who had anything to do with his birth. He wishes the man who brought his father the good news had strangled him instead. He wishes, in fact, that God would treat him as harshly as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Jeremiah's mood is swung from praising to cursing with dizzying speed. One verse is a song of high praise. The next is a curse of utter despair. John Calvin, the great commentator, was absolutely mystified at this comment by Jeremiah. In his commentary, he writes, this seems to be a levity unworthy of the holy man to pass suddenly from thanksgiving to God into curses as though he had forgotten himself. Brothers and sisters, but isn't this so true of our life as well? Aren't we schizophrenic in our faith? We are one at the same time. We are saints and we are sinners. Our sins are forgiven, but we continue to sin. One minute we praise, the next minute we curse. One moment we rejoice in God's plan, the very next we resist his will. And so Jeremiah's curse forms this lament. 
It's the bitterest of all laments in the book of Jeremiah. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and end my days in shame? Jeremiah knew the trouble of persecution. He knew his heart ached as he watched God's people reject God's word. He knew the shame of public humiliation. And all his suffering raised huge questions in his mind. And so as we close, this just the fourth point. Although suffering can place a huge question mark over our existence, it never has the last word. This last verse ends with a question that Jeremiah himself is in no shape to answer, but for which scripture contains a great answer. Why did Jeremiah come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow? God gave Jeremiah the answer when he called him into ministry. In chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Jeremiah traces his troubles back to the womb. But he didn't go back far enough. God could trace his promises back way before the womb. God had a purpose for Jeremiah's life since before the beginning of time. And the prophet needed to be reminded that from all eternity, God had set him apart for the ministry God had called him to. So brothers and sisters, this morning, these can be depressing words, words that we struggle with. But maybe you need this reminder this morning as well. Do you feel that you're suffering? Do you feel at times that you're ridiculed by friends and family? Do you feel that there are enemies waiting to trip you up? Do you get depressed and are you weighed down by the ungodliness of society around about us? Are there times in your experience when you too wonder, why did I ever come out of my mother's womb? This is why. God has set you apart for salvation and for a ministry. And before the beginning of time, he planned to save you in Jesus, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And then he set you apart to do his work, for we are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Suffering, life's pressures, can always place a giant question mark over our lives. But brothers and sisters, never forget this, that God's grace always has the last word. Let's pray together. Father, as we sit in this place this morning, you know us. You know our hearts. You know the purpose for which we have been created. You know that even from the time of our birth, the ways that you have planned us to walk, the experiences that come our way. Father, at times we often feel like Jeremiah did in this chapter. 
but we thank you like Jeremiah did, that we can trust you, that in the midst of all of life's upheavals, you are constantly with us. You are constantly looking after us. You are constantly directing our paths. Father, help us, weak as we are, sinful as we are, help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so we come, we come to this table this morning, a place where we find renewal, a place where we find refreshment. Father, in all of our life, be it good or bad, be it be, be it be difficult or relatively easy, may we always keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. May we take your promises and rest and trust in those which you've given to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.